morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the 28th uh, Hands-On Agile Meetup. Today, we're going to explore the brand new Scrum Guide 2020. Um, yesterday, I published an article with um, about 10 changes I find significant, and I uh, picked eight of those. And um, I would like to run an experiment with you. So what we're going to do is we will discuss these changes and we will discuss these changes in the way of running a conversation cafe and not just one, but eight conversation cafes in parallel. This is going to be the task for, for this evening. And I'm really curious to see how this is going to work out. However, before we get into the nitty gritty details, uh, let's have a round of networking and get to know each other a bit. So um, we will have our traditional uh, impromptu networking. So just in case uh, you're not familiar with that um, microstructure, um, I will send you into pairs. Yeah, should work, we're 52. <laughs> um, I will send you to pairs and for five minutes, uh, you will basically talk about three questions. Why am I here? How can I contribute to make this a success for everyone? And what do I wanna take home in return? So very simple, why are you here? What can I take home with me? How can I contribute to make this a success? Traditionally, it's meant to be that one side is talking and the other one is listening, but I very well know that after a few minutes, it starts uh, to get into a nice chat, but that is fine too. Okay, so any more questions that are burning on your soul that need to be answered right away? Hi, hey Stephen. Uh, this is Himadri from India. Hello, Himadri. Uh, yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for your time to Welcome. helping us to understand the new changes that uh, Scrum Guy 2020. I just have a simple question. Like people who are uh, preparing for Scrum Master Assessment or Level mm -hmm. 1, 2, 3. Mm -hmm. So uh, as already Scrum Guy published, based on what new scrum guide or it will be the old one that is going to be simple so until Jan january there won't be any changes in the in the certifications um so you're good to go uh, with the old one and starting in january uh, the language will be updated to the new language or the new uh, new terms and then you will see slowly but steadily a rollout of new questions that are more specific to the Scrum Guide 2020. There won't be any mean questions like compare 2017 to 2020 or something like that. This is not <laughs> going to happen. Yeah, <laughs> Alexander, you're laughing, but <laughs> some, this should, could be a concern for people. That's not a four minute question, unfortunately. <laughs> So if you already have a certification, don't worry, no need to recertify yourself. Uh, this is not uh, one of the big software companies, right? Uh, Scrum is still Scrum. Okay, so let's get started with the um, impromptu networking, okay? Shall we? Good, we will meet again in five minutes. Okay, welcome back everyone. I hope you enjoyed this brief networking phase. Um, now let's get into the nitty gritty. I would like to start with uh, sharing the eight issues that I found remarkable about the uh, Scrum Guide 2020. Number one, there are no more roles. As it says, the Scrum team consists of one Scrum master, one product owner and developers. Um, within the Scrum team, there are no sub teams or hierarchies. That's nothing new. It's a cohesive unit of professionals focused on one objective at the time, the product goal. Well, the product goal, of course, is new, but um, again, it's not surprising if we have a more holistic uh, understanding of Scrum and how a Scrum team works to be successful uh, practically has always been that way. Um, I'm not quite sure why there are no more roles because um, the, uh, the, the, the functions are still uh, attached to individuals. Um, and on the other side, we now have accountabilities um, that are significantly more detailed than before. For example, the Scrum team is now responsible or accountable for uh, delivering a valuable, useful product increment every single sprint. Well, the developers, um, besides the 
the kind of abilities we already they already had, you know, uh, creating the sprint backlog, for example, are now also accountable for holding each other accountable as professionals, which I find an interesting development. Um, on the side of the product owner, the accountabilities now also mean that the communication of the product goal. So why are we fighting here? Um, is uh, uh, belongs to the product owner as well as product backlog transparency is uh, named for the first time and of course our scrum master we have uh, basically the same accountabilities as before um, although impediment removal is no longer um, the main task uh, we cause this now in the future which i find interesting probably was a question of um, maybe product owner scrum master have too far become occupational uh, titles or something like that and they wanted to make sure that the focus is not on the title uh, but actually on on the, the work and jobs at hand to make the scrum team successful so i think it's an interesting step there is no more development team so developers uh, as they are called now are the people in the scrum team that are committed to creating any aspect of a usable increment each sprint um, I think this is a very good clarification uh, of what has been practiced before anyway. I mean, uh, I can't recall any single team uh, where um, the lawyer that was contributing to creating a piece of software in a highly regulated market uh, did not feel as a member of the development team because his or her contribution was crucial. But it's Good that now we have a black on white, so to speak, that now it is uh, stated officially. What I really appreciate is the uh, new focus on the Scrum team. So if you um, have already had probably a look at the Scrum Guide reordered, you will see how long the section about the Scrum team has become. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the responsibilities of other roles are now focused on on the Scrum team. It's a truly holistic approach on how to achieve success for our customers and how to move forward as a team. And it's really interesting. So Scrum team is responsible for all product related activities from stakeholder collaboration, verification, maintenance, operation, experimentation, research and development to anything else that might be required. So this is really branching out and into the rest of the organization. It will be very interesting to see what kind of discussions will develop around this. And uh, I mean, if we stick with the software metaphor, we uh, Scrum just swallowed DevOps, right? <laughs> so this is going to be really interesting. And by the way, also uh, the whole thing of product discovery, you know, so it's no longer dual track Scrum, it's just Scrum. So which I find, <laughs> find interesting. Um, a change I did not expect was the axing of servant leadership as an explicit uh, mentioning in the Scrum Guide. Um, Scrum masters are true leaders who serve the Scrum team and the large organization. There are several other occupations that come to my mind that do the same, you know, however at a different level as a Scrum master. So um, personally, I will still stick with the idea of um, servant leadership because i believe that's the essence of what we do as scrum masters and how we are supposed to actually address the issues we're facing but um let's see how this is going to uh, work out in in practice uh, i just hope it's not pushing the scrum master role more towards uh, a delivery manager or project manager that that would be unpleasant i believe on the other side uh, we finally have a product goal i mean I've never met uh, a team who uh, had no idea what they were fighting for, who were aimlessly uh, moving around and doing here a bit and doing there a bit. But it's good to know that the product goal describes the future state of the product, which can serve as a target for the Scrum team to plan against. The product goal is a long-term objective for the Scrum team. And there's another, um, another interesting sentence which says, okay, we work on one product goal at a time. So once we finish that and then we start something else which I believe is also a good thing because it's, I believe the first time that this uh, work in progress limit or product goal in progress limit is introduced. So I really like that addition. Hand in hand with the previous product goal goes the product definition. A product is a vehicle to deliver value. It has a clear boundary, known stakeholders, well-defined users or customers. A product could be a service, a physical product or something more abstract. 
So again, this is Scrum branching out into the rest of the world. We're no longer just talking about software. We're also addressing other things. And there's a whole variety of things that you can think about. So from one second to another, um, the, the classic Scrum for marketing uh, becomes not just feasible, but also officially supported. If that's a good idea is uh, of course to be seen. Another interesting change, I believe, is the product release, because the product release is actually not really mentioned. Before, we always had this potentially shippable product increment. There was this releasing was all de facto built into the definition. And now we have the sprint review should never be considered a gate to releasing value. Okay, there's release. And uh, if a product backlog item does not meet the definition of done, it cannot be released or even presented at the sprint review. Those are just indirect indications of where the, all of this heading. And more interestingly, the prerogative of the product owner, you know, as product owners, we, uh, we decide when to ship, what to whom, uh, is no longer stated anywhere. Again, it uh, becomes a, a responsibility of the Scrum team. Um, so we all, as a collaborative, uh, decide uh, what to ship when to whom. You know, so uh, the borgification is <laughs> of a Scrum team is uh, moving forward. And finally, we have commitments. <clears throat> so each artifact contains a commitment to ensure it provides information that enhances transparency and focus against which progress can be measured. So what we have here are. For example, the classic ones, the sprint goal uh, is the commitment to the artifact of the sprint backlog. The new product goal is the commitment to the uh, product backlog. And the definition of done is the commitment to the product increment, um, which I find um, also a good change in the sense that before we had always had this definition of done and sprint goals somewhat floating around. <laughs> you know, it was very hard to get, uh, get a grip of that, uh, where to put them. It's not an artifact, it's not a role, not an event. Well, what are we talking about here? And now we know what it is, it's a commitment. So I think uh, that's another really good uh, way of extending and enhancing and refining the, the, the Scrum Guide. I really like that one too. Okay, those eight topics, um, will be the topics that we are planning to discuss in our conversation cafes, which will be the next step. Before we start the shift and share, just a brief feedback. Um, how did this work? The conversation cafe in the, in the breakout room uh, with uh, someone remotely shouting at you from time to time. <laughs> yeah, Stefan, I must say, surprisingly good. Yeah? Yeah. Good here, too. That was because of the host uh, angle. Yeah. <laughs> what's, what's yes, we had an excellent up? host, uh, this Hans, yes. Uh, yeah, and we had a good size of, first we were six, then later on seven, which was a good size. Not too much, not too many, but not too few. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was a bit worried about servant leadership. There were 11 people or so, 11 people. That was quite a lot, 12. I think we ended up having 13 for a 13. good amount of time. But I think we had a, a pretty good, pretty effective conversation. Okay, cool. Yeah, great. I'm really looking forward to this. So um, what I would like to suggest is that I share the screen so that we get it on the recording. And um, someone uh, from your... Uh, respective group uh, or some some several people just start uh, sharing with that what they found out what they were talking about so i think can we aim for three minutes per per group uh, let's give it a try and see if that works okay who would like to start um number two would no more dev teams do you feel capable of starting, kicking off uh, our shift and share session. Yeah, so I was elected to, to present our results and we were trying to put this straight to the point. Yeah, and we had actually three findings uh, out of our discussion. Uh, the, first, the first finding was um, that we think uh, based on this new setting, uh, we will have less fights between the development team or the former development team and the product owner. 
where we were uh, not not very much clear and uh, where are some concerns is uh, how this uh, new model will scale uh, having more than um, 10 people in uh, as assigned being as developers and what we consider also um, that these changes are very marginal based on the 2017 version of the scrum guide but we saw a benefit for newcomers without having this knowledge uh, to get a better start with uh, with the setting so this these were our three key findings in the session. So I don't need three minutes for this. Generally, you would say thumb up for the change? Um, in general, yes. Yeah. OK. Any questions? I do have a question. OK, go. A team is different from a group. In a team, there are different type of relationships um, uh, versus a group. Now, uh, when we are removing this team and uh, we are all uh, developers or members of the Scrum team, how is that going to impact the developers themselves? I think the main problem with this old setup with the 2017 Scrum Guide was that you had these development teams and the misunderstood perception of the Scrum Master to heavily protect this development team versus the PO, and this was causing frictions. So that's why removing this, uh, let's say, organizational umbrella, um, at least per, uh, from the conceptual point of view, is trying to remove this, uh, this, this tension between those things and uh, that the people should understand themselves as one team working towards one goal and not having some sort of uh, confrontation between PO and development teams being protected by the Scrum Guide. I think this was the main reason behind this. Stefan, unfortunately, I can't see your clock, but I'm still in time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. This is all working flawlessly at the moment. I understand, but um, in reality, I'm not quite sure how that is going to work. <laughs> yeah, we, we were also not sure on how this works in a scaling context, but I think if you, if you consider a single team, you will get, I think, a better relationship towards the product owner by having this new setting. Product owner still is a representative of stakehold stakeholders. Yes. That uh, never forget. This is correct, but we all said that the Scrum Master was misunderstanding his role mainly also very often that he is really the protector of the team towards everything else. But he should also work together with the product owner. And this was misunderstood in the past very often. Okay, when we are saying protecting, it was more like educating the, um, well, my understanding educating the product owner, for example, not to change things during the sprint that would endanger the sprint goal, uh, not to try to squeeze in additional things that did not meet the sprint goal, pressuring the team, allowing the team to, the development team to self-organize. That's the kind of protection or having various stakeholders coming directly to the team and um, oh, uh, what is this about? Because um, sometimes there are multiple stakeholders, right? For, for the same uh, product goal, uh, not only one. And having uh, the stakeholders coming directly to the developer and saying, oh, uh, I want this by uh, tomorrow. And what is the developer gonna say? No, I don't yes. think. It is in the guide. If, if, you, if you want something different, <laughs> go and convince your product owner. Okay. Another I minute. Have, I think we have the situation between the theory and the practice. I think in, in the practical, practical world, uh, you have situations where you have changes to your pro to, to your sprint scope. So, and uh, usually uh, in such a situation, the product owner is deciding to have a sprint scope. But you have, if you have a scrum master, which is protecting by definition because misunderstanding is for the development team, and then not allowing this change then I think you have a an, an, an mis, an, an, an misconstellation. So I think you always have to have some sort of, uh, uh, some sort of collaboration in this organization to get to the, best, uh, to the best result and not having this misunderstood role of protecting the uh, protection of the Scrum Master. I think this is the misconception which is removed, I think a little bit by this uh, change. Okay, thank you. Hey, we have to move on, I'm afraid. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> So next on the list would be servant leadership. Are you prepared? Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I can jump in for us. I think I can summarize our conversation. We did have mm -hmm. a good conversation. The group agreed that the change in phrase from 
servant leader to true leader doesn't change the role. It's just a change in terminology. And so by changing from servant leader to true leader, if you don't have the respect from your teams and you don't have the influence with your teams to get them to change, to get them to try things, to improve, looking for new opportunities, just changing the term isn't going to get them to behave any differently. And so it's still on us as scrum masters to find ways to articulate the value that we deliver to the teams between the ceremonies. And so it's still about delivering value. It's still about serving the team. That hasn't changed. Anybody want to add anything else? Uh, from your team or questions? From, from my team, or we can take questions. <laughs> For me, it sounds confusing because you just said that, you know, they are uh, Scrum Master is serving the team, but then, uh, you know, uh, he's the true leader. So if he's serving the team, that is that falls under the servant leadership philosophy. And yeah. there are different styles of leadership, right? Um, so what is the style of true leadership? I know what is the style of servant leadership because a leader who serves his team or you know stakeholders to make sure that we have uh, you know uh, we have proper implementation of scrum framework and uh, we have a proper product out in the market quality product that the customers like right or love but true leadership what does it mean yeah we talked a little bit about that it, it is it can be confusing the scrum guide was written was changed to say a true leader who serves the scrum team. So serves is still in there. They just swapped it. I think it's gonna take time to see what this change does to the scrum master role. Uh, we're reacting a day after it was rolled out. We have our opinions, but it's not gonna change how we behave as scrum masters today or tomorrow or even next month. But it might change how we as scrum masters coach other scrum masters or how we coach the teams or how we coach leaders in our organization to better understand what the role is and how we add value to our teams. I don't think we're going to see results immediately. I think we also mentioned, Scott, that um, depending on the organization, if the organization actually sees scrum masters as administrators, and that's mm. why they hire them, and then they have and they see them as leaders, it's going to take time again, change, it take time for us to change their mind on that. Now, maybe with this rule, maybe using the leadership, which I don't really like the word true leadership, and I agree to the other guy saying, what does true leadership characteristics mean from seven leadership? You know, so if the environment is not created for scrum masters to be seen as leaders, then they'll always be seen like that. If they hire them to come and just help us make sure the team are in line, they are still seeing them as you know, manage and control, just make be facilitators. But if they're seeing them as leaders, enabling effectiveness, allowing them to grow, you know, become a high performance team, because that's what Scrum Master does also, also coach and mentor and train them. So some organization actually sees that. I mean, I work in Europe and they, they, a lot of that, this emphasis on Scrum Masters also being agile coaching, leadership role. So depending on the organization that you are in, if they're seeing them as administrators, it's going to take time to actually first change the organizational mindset of how they see Scrum Masters than just about the team. It's not just about the team or the scrum master so it's much more than that and um, seven leadership is not just about scrum master for me it's about every leader it's about saving it's about bringing out developing your, your team developing your organization developing people in-house the people itself it's much more than that so you like you said they just swap it it's still they're still it's still saving there you know jeff said it when he was describing his conversation with ken yesterday that they they thought to make the change because calling the scrum master a servant leader made it seem like we were note takers and meeting schedulers and we're not. And so it's still, it's on us. You know, th these are just changes in the guide. There's just, these are just words. It's still on us to show the value that we bring as a scrum master between these scrum events. We're yeah. not there just to facilitate. And honestly, I, I believe that in a lot of cases we should not be facilitating. We're not the best person to be facilitating a lot of these scrum events. You also have the, the this line that says ensuring that uh, all Scrum events take place, which means actually they're somewhat implying that you 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 make sure that those uh, uh, actually happen, mm -hmm. and you can do so much if the team uh, complies, then you can do that. But you're not there to to, to be with a baseball bat in the entrance of the room and say like now it's time for you to have a good uh, meeting. You know, mm -hmm. this is not the way it should work. 
You should get the team to a point where they don't have to need you anymore. And like they become yeah. self-managed. They can do those meetings themselves if they have to do meetings. At the point, I mean, you can still attend retrospective planning just to see that they're in the right path to help them, guide them. But you don't have to arrange it for them. They do it themselves. And most of the teams I, I work with, they do it. I get them to do it themselves after at least one, after three, four months. They should be able to do mm -hmm. simple things like that. Because you know, Scrum Master is bigger than just facilitating things, meetings. Right. Water pointed out they, that change was made in the Scrum Guide too. The 2017 version said that the Scrum Master facilitates the Scrum events as needed or required or as requested or needed, yes. right? Yes. And now it just says that we ensure that they happen. Mm -hmm. That's a significant change too. But again, they're just words today. They're going to take time to change behaviors. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Thanks a lot. That was uh, a really good analysis. I totally, totally appreciate that. So product goal, do you consider yourself able to share with us what your findings yes. are? Yeah, Teresa speaking okay. here and um, I'll just start and maybe my team has further ideas to add. So um, we really enjoyed the conversation cafe and we're very happy about the additional 10 minutes. I was the timekeeper and I had us ready 10 minutes before it was necessary. So we had a great sharing after that. We had people in the team who have split heads that drew us very quickly to the question, how can the team have only one goal at a time? It may be really helpful to focus, but what happens if you have different sources of funding and different stakeholders? And then a second really big topic was that vision does no longer appear in the Scrum Guide, yet you need a vision, an inspiration, a broader view to walk towards. Otherwise, it does not matter where you actually run towards and you can run really, really quickly and yet get nowhere where you need to be. Um, then we got into some nitty gritty details, like what is actually a good product goal? And when will we take back on that? Like where does this fit into the inspect and adapt cycle and which event should this be in? Open questions yet to be filled by practice. And of course, the big question, how does this help increase transparency and support inspect and adapt in general? Um, we opted against speaking about J JIRA and practices like Epix. And the big question to leave all of us with is um, the task of the Scrum Master to support the product owner. And I'm just disturbed by the chat. So uh, yeah, how does the Scrum Master find the techniques for effective product goal definition? So uh, maybe my team wants to add something or maybe we can just share in the group how we are supposed to find these techniques. Thank you. Basically, we came out just with questions, right? And uh, we did not really have a clear understanding of uh, what a product goal encompasses. Uh, and we thought it's better to raise questions out there because as we raise the questions, we'll have a better understanding based on some of the discussions that will happen here or in future. Mm -hmm. I believe it's completely legitimate to refer to Scott. It, 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 it's 24 hours out here, right? <laughs> so. Um... Maybe it's a bit too much to expect that we fully understand all of this uh, right now already. Yeah, uh, I agree with my teammates, of course. Uh, we thought it, we have some possible answers, but we thought that uh, focusing on the right questions uh, will lead us to reflect on mm -hmm. good answers and uh, what to Google. <laughs> so that's what was our thinking. So uh, that was really, really interesting for us. Okay, then let's move on to the product release. Are you ready to go? Or sure. may I you guess, want to start? Sure, absolutely. I can jump right in. Uh, so I think we had some really uh, great discussion going on about the idea of um, decoupling the product release from the idea of a potentially shippable increment. Um, and we discussed how uh, it makes sort of Scrum more applicable because not every Scrum team can ship at the end of the sprint because of restrictions around business sectors, uh, regulations, the type of product or the dependencies involved uh, in a release. Um, and I think one of the key things that, that we really had a really productive discussion around was the idea that, you know, the sprint time box is intended to deliver value, um, but there's many more kinds of value than simply a potentially shippable increment that you know, if the outcome of a sprint cycle is building stakeholder trust, uh, identifying or mitigating risks, um, 
creating opportunities to inspect and adapt, clarifying goals or reducing complexity are all uh, different kinds of values that can be delivered out of that time box and can be very helpful. I have a question. I, are you referring to a non-software environment, correct? Not necessarily. You may even in software environment, you may have uh, regulations around which don't just allow you to uh, post a software increment after two weeks into a, a production environment. Yeah, you may have the need for extra uh, extra validation release procedures and so on, which are not really feasible to do after each and every two week sprint. But you weren't obligated to release every sprint even before. Yes, yes, yeah. So in, in that sense, the, this mm -hmm. change here was uh, now fits more to the reality, so to say. Yeah. Personally, I don't see a change in this. Uh, even before, you could release as many times as you wanted, or you could hold on to the a usable product increment. That's why it was called potentially releasable. It just had to be a usable increment that if the product owner decided to release it, it could have been released. It never said the Scrum Guide that you have to release at the end of each screen. I would argue that the, the freeing of the um, end of the sprint from even a potentially releasable increment um, into a wider possibility of coming to the end of the sprint and having uh, what the result is, uh, is helps clarify the methodology and uh, to a wider group and creates a possibly wider definition of what that sprint goal could be at the end of that sprint. Oh, sorry, the sprint goal that was set at the beginning of the sprint that could be delivered. My teams have always viewed releasable as subjective. And so we would release it into a non-prod environment and it's released. It's not in production, but it's still released. It's usable in a non-prod environment. We're able to have our stakeholders test in those other areas. So mm -hmm. it was still released according to the term releasable, just because it didn't say released to production, right? For sure. The release idea was uh, to obtain feedback. That was the yeah. thing mm -hmm. from whoever was your... So if for you obtaining uh, a feedback was... Um, enough to release in a non-production environment and you could obtain your feedback. Sure. Yeah. And I, I have the luxury, I guess, of working with internal stakeholders where I support business applications. Not as easy to do that if you're supporting end users uh, out in the wild. I think one scenario, definitely our scenario, we, we work with multiple clients uh, within a single sprint and we might release within the sprint but review out a step with the sprints. So it, it, it kind of frees that up so it's not quite so, it doesn't feel quite so naughty. It always felt a bit, a little bit naughty to not review at the end of the sprint and release during the sprint, whereas it's, it opens it up now to, there's the inspect and adapt cycle and there's a the release, which is two separate things, which may or may not be in step or may not. But, but even before you were not restricted to the sprint review to get uh, feedback from your main stakeholder and no one, prevented you to release as many times as you wanted in the sprint. If you could get the yes or the go from the product owner. You know, I, th I think for us, what one of the things that the, the discussion really was that by explicitly crossing those lines out, it makes it a much um, easier to understand that that is not a gateway and also potentially applicable to other types of development using sprints other than strictly potentially software uh, projects. I think a lot of the changes in language is, is uh, caused by this idea that we loosen this, this, this uh, historical uh, background of software development and just broaden the field, you know, uh, be more inclusive and uh, provide the, uh, the framework and the practices to general application to complex problems, right? So it makes life so much easier on the one side and so much more complicated on the other side because now there's room for interpretation. Okay, which leads us to the last one that we still have, that would be commitments. What we did was actually break with all the rules of uh, the chat as, uh, as you could already have imagined. 
we were talking about uh, commitment as a scrum value and uh, commitment to, to the artifacts that is actually a refreshing thing. But still, the fact that they're not describing actually what actually every one of these uh, values means still leaves a pretty much room of interpretation and misinterpretation. Because people could also believe that commitment is just commitment to, to these artifacts if they were skimming and scanning or misreading the content of the of the guide. Stating that uh, there's a commitment to the sprint goal is, is very important, yet they were before talking about uh, also committing to the sprint backlog. Yes and no, there was some movement uh, back and forth there. And in the end, they, they, they stated that they're making a forecast. And yet it's not, you don't have the clarity there that this uh, forecast is still uh, something that can be adapted uh, during the sprint, as long as you don't uh, risk the, the, the sprinkle. And there's nothing uh, of clarity into this here in, in uh, adapting the uh, sprinkle when it, for instance, lacks the clarity because of like ambiguity or something. There's a little bit of a conflict here in, in other parts as well when it comes to the definition of done. We both had in the, in the team the feeling that uh, the previous version was a little bit better because it also uh, helped a lot to describe where uh, the team has to improve itself. As it used to state that uh, as Scrum teams mature, it's expected that the definition of done will expand to, to be more stringent, you know? and therefore deliver more quality. This is missing there, yeah. as is right now. And this makes a big deal in our current state. Yeah. I'm not uh, showing the direction into the development of our skills here. And you also have this lack of advocating for, for a continuous improvement. It's not just nice that they, they mentioned lean, they have to really incorporate uh, the concepts and the ideas that come from that in order to be able to really swallow lean into this one. An additional point is the sprint goal is a commitment for the developers. And the old Scrum guide said there is a Scrum team and there are the developers and the PO. Here the sprint goal is, as far as I understood it, restricted as a goal, as a commitment to the developers, not to the PO. So is the PO out of the sprint goal not committed? No, the, the, the sprint goal is the single objective for the sprint. And the sprint yeah. goal is still gonna be determined in the sprint planning together with the development team. Yeah, the new Scrum Guide 2020 says the sprint yeah. goal is the commitment of the developers, period. Although the sprint goal is a commitment by the developers, it provides flexibility in terms of the exact work needed to achieve it. But it was a commitment by the development team even before. They were committing to the sprint goal, mm -hmm. not to the forecast. Yes, that's okay. That's no problem with me. My question is regarding to the PO. Is the PO related to the sprint goal as a commitment as well? That's my but question. In, but in what sense? Because the sprint goal is defined in the sprint planning and it is the PO that comes with a suggestion based on the product goal and engages the team to actually come up with a sprint goal. Mm -hmm. That's my understanding. I'm going to try to, to replace the, the thing that uh, Michael is uh, trying to, to explain here, which uh, causes some rest. And it's that the fact that uh, there's actually no need in, in saying that the developers commit to that sprint goal. It's, it should be stated that the team commits to the sprint goal where the entire team uh, is taking responsibility here for actually making it uh, to the end line, you know? Define developers. It's everybody on the team. The thing is, it's a little bit of a contradiction because then it says the Scrum team, the entire Scrum team is accountable yep. for creating mm -hmm. a valuable, useful uh, increment every sprint. 
and then it's only the developers that commit to the sprint goal. Yeah, that's the reason why you, you have this open for, for misinterpretation. And yeah. this yeah. this mm -hmm. will cause problems. Yeah. 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 We're already testing that. <laughs> <laughs> So probably we can agree that if the Scrum team collaboratively picks a sprint goal, they're all committed to it because the sprint goal reflects the path to the product increment they are supposed to be delivering. Uh, so maybe that's a way of uh, interpreting this this uh, new tech. Yeah. yeah, but it was pretty much like during the the uh, the entire time we had mm -hmm. we were both ranting about uh, things that yeah. were. <laughs> Way too open to interpretation and, and uh, yeah. quite open to misinterpretation. That That's the Absolutely. thing that uh, is yeah. causing the pain here. Yeah. Which is a great segue yeah. basically yeah. to the uh, outro I was about to start anyway. So what we did here today was basically uh, a quick shot uh, given the incident that happened yesterday, the release of the new Scrum Guide. Yeah. Uh, however, starting next year, I hope we will have a, a more precise approach to this whole thing you know because um, uh, a few weeks down the road we will have learned a bit more and then we can basically come up with good topics how to work on those actually this was um, our discussion uh, with uh, eduardo and me on um, the definition of the commitment or the relationship commitments to artifacts is a very good um, description and idea mm -hmm. of the scrum guide However, how they describe this relationship or do not really define the true relationship opens a lot of misinterpretation and an open range of interpretations. And in this sense, some parts of the previous version of the Scrum Guide were more precise. Yeah, it was, was uh, less, uh, less complex in that manner. You know, so I think there's always a price to pay to make something yeah. shorter. Mm. Okay, so um, let me stop sharing here. Um, of course, you have access to to uh, to the whole files. Please download them, use them, etc. PP. Thank you for for investing all your time and hard work here. Mm -hmm.